In this video, I'll discuss how we calculate returns and standard deviations using historical data. Then we'll talk about the Sharpe ratio. And then finally, I'll discuss VAR or value at risk. When we want to estimate past returns and volatility, we need to use time series data from some financial database. Now there are several databases that we can use, but the best of these for your purposes will be Yahoo Finance or the Bloomberg terminal. You need this data to test any trading strategy. When you download the data, you'll need to clean it, calculate the returns, and then calculate the standard deviation of those returns. Notice here that I, I use volatility and standard deviation interchangeably, but they mean the same thing in investments, as I said on the last video. All right, now let's talk about how you get that data using first Bloomberg and then Yahoo Finance. So step one, to get that data on Bloomberg, well, you could do this a couple of different ways. The way I recommend is that you open Excel and then hopefully you've added the Bloomberg tab. Bloomberg actually provides an add-in for Excel that you can uh, set up. And then you just go over to the function builder in the tab, select BDH and all of the inputs you want, and you'll be able to download the returns that you want. And at that point, you're done. If you want to see how to do that, in greater detail, just go ahead and click on this link in our PowerPoint, and it'll take you to another video that I've created that goes through that in detail. Now, another way to get that data is to just go to Yahoo Finance. What you're going to do is you're going to type in the ticker symbol of the stock you want, and let me show you this. All right, so I'm on Yahoo Finance. Let's type in the ticker symbol of the stock I want. Let's say Ford. Ford comes up. And now I'm going to go down here a little bit, go over to historical data, and then I'm going to change the characteristics to get the data set that I want. So right now I'm set to daily prices over the last year. Maybe I want the last five years. Well, once I've selected everything that I want, I'm going to apply that and that'll give me those five years worth of data and then I can download it. And then as you can see it, it gave me a CSV file. So when I open this, I now have the opening price. So the price at the opening bell at 930, the high price of the day for each day, the low price of the day, the closing price at four o'clock. And then we also have this adjusted close. Now the adjusted close is the most important column of these columns that we have. The reason it's important is because it accounts for the effects of dividends and share splits. So when we actually calculate returns, we're going to calculate returns using the adjusted closing price from day to day. Volume just indicates the number of shares that are traded on that day. All right, let's go ahead and calculate the historical return and volatility of Google. So there's a tab I put into our chapter four spreadsheet, and we're going to go ahead and take that Google data, calculate the returns, and then calculate the, the volatility of Google. So let's get started. So here's our data. Like I said, I just downloaded uh, one year's worth of data. And let's go ahead and calculate the returns first. So these will be our daily returns for Google. So all I'm going to do is just use our very basic return formula. Take the price at the end or the end of closing or at closing for 12-31-2015. Subtract the closing price on the previous day and then divide by the closing price on the previous day. And I have my return. Now to simplify this process, I'm going to copy this formula all the way down by double clicking on the bottom right hand corner of this cell. And as you can see, if I scroll down, I have all the returns. Now, another trick that you can use if you want to scroll down all the way to the bottom or to the left or the right or the top very quickly is, well, I'll show you how to do it going to the bottom. Just hold control shift down and you'll go all the way to the bottom of whatever column you're dealing with. You can also go, you can also do control shift left and that'll take you to the extreme left. And then if you want to go to the top, just control shift up and that'll take you to the top of the column or the, the list of uh, values that you have.
Now notice here that I downloaded one extra day's worth of data. So I all I have all the values, all the prices in 2015 for Google, but I also included the last price or the last day's data for 2014. The reason I did that is because when I calculate the return on the first day of 2015, I'm going to need the closing price on the previous day, that 12-30-2014. So now I have it, I'm just going to de delete this divide by zero error. I, I don't need it. I don't need any returns in 2014. So now I have the returns on every day in 2015. Next, I'm going to, just so we can get a geometric average, I'm just going to take 1 plus each return. All right, now let's copy down our 1 plus return. And we'll go all the way to the bottom. And we will delete this superfluous observation that we have down here since we're taking one plus a blank value. Just get rid of that. We'll go all the way to the top. And let's get our geometric daily mean return plus one. So equals geo mean. Highlight our one plus returns. Close parentheses. And this is what it looks like in the cell itself. We'll just hit enter. And our average daily return is just going to be that minus 1, or about 15 basis points. Next, let's get our daily volatility. And if you remember from the previous video, volatility is calculated using standard deviation. So the formula that we're going to use here is the sample standard deviation, stdev.s. Now, remember the previous video, the reason we're using the sample standard deviation is because we only have a sample of the returns of Google. We don't have the entire population data, so we have to use the sample formula. So I'm going to use this, highlight all of our one plus, all of our returns in column H, close parentheses, and we have our daily volatility. All right, now let's scale up our daily returns and volatility to annualized numbers. So for the annual return, we're going to take equals 1 plus our average daily return to the power of 252 and subtract 1. And then we're going to scale up our daily volatility by taking our daily volatility number and multiplying that by the square root of 252. And remember from the last video, the reason we use 252 is because there are normally 252 trading days in a calendar year. So there we go. Our annual volatility is 0.2949, which is pretty consistent with a lot of S&P 500 firms. To give you a range, most firms will have annualized volatilities of somewhere between 0.15 and 0.50. So Google's annualized volatility is right in line with that. The annualized volatility of the S&P 500 ETF, for example, which should be one of our most diversified portfolios and therefore one of our least risky portfolios, should be somewhere around 0.15. All right, let's try one more example where we use time series data. And in this example, we're going to be considering an investment in Apple. But first, we want to calculate the firm's daily and annual returns and annu and return volatility from 1-1-2015 to 12-31-2015. And to do that, we're going to need some data. So let's go ahead and just start from the beginning. I'll actually do all of this from scratch just so you can see it. So first things first, I'm going to go to Yahoo Finance, and I'm going to search for Apple. Apple's ticker symbol is AAPL, and as you can see, they're doing quite well as of the time that I'm recording this video. They actually just reported quarterly earnings last night, and they, they announced that they were selling a lot more iPhones in the Chinese market. So they're, they're going gangbusters today. All right, now let's get a historical set of data. Go over to the historical data tab, 
and we want data from, well, our end date is going to be 12 31 2015. Our starting date, we want the day prior to the first date that we need returns for. So I'm going to put in 12 31 2014 and apply that. And I've already specified daily data. That's just how it comes. We'll apply that. And now we will download. All right. So let's go ahead and clean this data. So first things first, I've got some issues with this stuff over here. Don't freak out whenever you see this. This just means that the column isn't wide enough. Just go over to the top of the column between the column and the next column, double click, and it'll auto size the column. Next, notice here that when you download the data, you get data going from the earliest date to the latest date. Personally, I prefer, I prefer to go from the latest date to the earliest date. It doesn't really make a difference as long as you calculate the numbers right. So I'm just going to sort by newest to oldest. And now I've got the last trading day at the top. So apparently there was no trading done on 12-31-2015. Next, we can get our returns. And our returns are just going to be the change in the adjusted closing price for each day. So adjusted closing price today minus adjusted closing price on the previous day divided by adjusted closing price on the previous day. And we'll copy that down. We'll convert to decimal places and take it out to two ba uh, to basis points. I'll go down here, delete the divide by zero error that we get because we have some missing we're not going to have a denominator for the return for 20 or 12 31 2014 and we'll go back up to the top all right so that's how you clean data and actually calculate daily returns now i've got some other stuff in the chapter 4 spreadsheet so i'll actually just go over to the spreadsheet and add in that stuff there all right i've copied over the data that i just downloaded and cleaned so let's go ahead and finish out this particular tab on the spreadsheet. So first things first, I want to get our geometric mean daily return. So I'm just going to take equals one plus our daily returns and copy that formula down. Next, I'm going to go over and use the geo mean formula to calculate our mean daily return. So equals geo mean and highlight our one plus daily returns, close parentheses, and minus one. And I will need to go down here to the bottom and I've got a 100% for some reason. We'll just clean that. And now we have our geometric mean daily return of something even smaller than a negative one basis point, or we have negative 0.0045%. A very, very small return daily. Okay, next let's get our daily variance and our daily standard deviation. So here we need our variance formula. Variance.s because we're using sample variance. We'll highlight all of our values for the variance. And next, we'll get our daily standard deviation. We could do this two ways. We could do it using the stdev.s formula and highlighting our returns. Or we could have just taken the square root of our daily variance. Next, let's get our annual return. And so for this, I'm just going to scale up using the formula I showed a little while ago, just 1 plus our geometric mean daily return to the power of 252 minus 1. And that'll get us our annual return. Next, let's get our annualized standard deviation. And that thing is going to be just our daily standard deviation times the square root of 252. And just for good measure, let's go ahead and get our skewness. So skewness and kurtosis are two other measures that can 
describe the probability distribution of a data set. So with skewness, we're determining whether it's left skewed or right skewed. In other words, is the tail longer on one side or the other? So equals SKEW, and we'll just highlight our returns. And here we find something pretty close to zero, which is uh, no skewness. So basically, we don't really have any skewness here. Uh, kurtosis indicates the fatness of the tails of the distribution. So equals curt, and we'll highlight our data. Okay, so we have a kurtosis of 1.3672. Uh, average kurtosis for a normal distribution is 3, but really anything above 1 is going to be okay. What this tells us is that our distribution is something called platycurtic, meaning it's it's got fatter tails than the, the normal distribution uh, usually does. Not necessarily a a uh, horrible thing, but it just it's another way to describe our probability distribution. All right, let's actually take a look at our probability distribution. So I, I worked this up before I recorded this video. This is a histogram of Apple's daily returns over a five-year period. Uh, so I broke it up into different bins just so you can see the pr the distribution of the returns. So over the five-year period when I pulled this data, the mean daily return was seven basis points, which is pretty sizable for any company. And our, our standard deviation daily was uh, 0.0171. Uh, you can get a pretty good sense of a, a bell distribu uh, a bell curve here. A normal distribution is kind of what this thing looks like. You can kind of get a sense that maybe there's there's some skewness here, uh, but it's not that large. But I just wanted to use this this chart to illustrate that returns are typically normally distributed, or they look normally distributed at first glance. And so that leads me to my next slide. Let's talk about the normal distribution. So we've already talked about how to clean the data necessary to analyze a security. Uh, as you saw, when we plot the returns on in a histogram, we do have something close to a normal distribution. We generally assume that stock returns follow a normal distribution. In other words, the expected return is also the median and the mode. The plot of a normal distribution is our classic bell curve. And the return probabilities are symmetric around the mean. So notice here that on each side of the mean, our return probabilities are pretty comparable on either side as we get further and further away from the, the mean. There are some significant benefits to assuming that returns are normally distributed. First, this means you can use the standard deviation as your primary measure of risk, which truth be told, we've kind of already been doing. Uh, but it's it's really important that our standard deviation is our really our only measure of risk that we really need. And that only occurs if returns are normally distributed. Otherwise, we have to start calculating skewness and kurtosis every time we do anything. Second, if the returns on every security in a portfolio are normally distributed, that means the returns of the portfolio itself which, are, which is going to be formed by all of those individual returns, will be normally distributed. We'll see the benefits of that in the next section of this class. And then finally, if returns are normally distributed, we can start to use more advanced statistical tools like the Sharpe Ratio or Value at Risk. So this is why it's so important to us that returns follow a normal distribution or something close or or something approximating a normal distribution. So let's talk about that. the first of those two measures I just mentioned, the Sharp Ratio. Now, the Sharp Ratio is a risk-adjusted return measure. You scale the quantity of the return on the stock minus the risk-free rate, RF, by the standard deviation of the stock. So we'll talk a heck of a lot more about risk-free rates later in this class, actually in in a big way in the next section 
of this course. But suffice it to say, our risk-free rate is always denoted as RF. Now, the sharp ratio essentially takes the, we calculate this using either expected returns or actual historical returns. Now, if we're using expected returns, we tend to refer to the top part of this formula as the risk premium. It's essentially the expected return beyond the risk-free rate that you will receive for holding on to risky securities. We're going to scale that by the standard deviation of our stock, and that'll give us our sharp ratio. However, if we have some actual returns, in other words, we have calculated the risk-free rate over the past year to be uh, 1% and the actual return of our stock to be 8%, our excess return would be 7%. This is, I mean, our excess return is just the difference between the actual return and the risk-free rate. There are some people that disagree. There's some ter people who argue that risk premium or excess return are kind of almost interchangeable. So I won't penalize you for mixing those up. But regardless, we scale the sharp ratio by the standard deviation. All right, so now let's talk about what happens if returns aren't normally distributed. If returns aren't normally distributed, uh, there might be another measure like the ones I just mentioned, like skewness or kurtosis, that captures the risk of the asset. It also means that that sharp ratio that I just showed you, whose denominator is standard deviation, is not going to be a good measure of risk-adjusted returns. Now, in addition to the sharp ratio, there's a lot of other measures that we can use to measure risk when returns are normally distributed. You probably remember seeing confidence intervals from your statistics course. Well, here's an example of how we can use those confidence interval formulas in the real world. If you've forgotten what confidence intervals are, these are bands that have some probability of, out of possible outcomes above and below them and are located plus or minus some standard deviation from the mean. Hopefully you remember that in a normal distribution, about 68% of the time, an outcome will be within one standard deviation of the mean, and approximately 95% of all future observations will be within two standard deviations of the mean. We generally identify the 5% and 95% confidence intervals, or the 1% and 99% confidence intervals. Now, VAR is a technique that makes use of the fact that our return variable is normally distributed. We identify the lower bound of a confidence interval, so we can say with 95 or 99% certainty that the next observation or return will be above the value at risk, or VAR. In other words, the VAR tells us the amount or return that's at the first or fifth percentile of the distribution. If you're a fund manager, this is good for you because it gives you an indication of how much you're likely to lose on a very bad day. Now let's see this graphically. So here I just drew up some uh, simulated data to illustrate our point. So here we have a normal distribution. Uh, again, I just simulated the data. That's why it doesn't look perfect, like our standard norm, normal uh, distribution here, but you can kind of get a sense. Uh, so our VAR of 0.05 indicates that 5% of the probability distribution will occur to the left of this line, and 95% of the probability distribution and hopefully uh, future returns will occur above that line. Now the 1% VAR is further back here. It tells us that only 1% of future outcomes will be lower than whatever this value is, and 99% of those future values will be higher than that. So notice here that we're focusing entirely on the left tail, the, the tail where there's usually some negative numbers. Uh, VAR is focused on really what's at risk in bad cases, so we don't care too much about what's happening at the, the top end here. VAR is essentially just a risk management tool. All right, now let's go ahead and use some data to calculate the VAR and Sharpe ratio. I've put a value at risk example in our spreadsheet, so let's go through it. And for this, we're going to use monthly data 
directly from the S&P 500 index starting in 1963. All right, so here's our data. And let's go through and calculate all of these things that you see here. Although just so you know, I did just specify a, a mean monthly risk-free rate for us. All right, first things first, let's get our geometric mean monthly return. So equals geo mean. And we've got our one plus returns here. So I'm going to highlight all the way to the bottom, close out parentheses and subtract one. And our geometric mean monthly return is going to be about 80 basis points. Next, let's get our monthly standard deviation. So equals stdev.s. And we will highlight our valuated returns, which are including dividends. So these are holding period return returns uh, all the way to the bottom. And we'll hit enter. And we now have our monthly standard deviation. Next, let's go ahead and identify our lower bound for the 5% and 1% levels, assuming a normal distribution. In other words, we're assuming that the returns on the S&P 500 index follow a normal distribution, kind of like the Apple returns that I showed you a few minutes ago. Now, the norm S in function identifies the value that we're going to use in our confidence interval to multiply with our, uh, our standard deviation. So we're going to specify that we want the 5% bound here. And with the normal distribution, and with the normal distribution, this is going to be our, our Z statistic. Next, we're going to get our 1% bound using the same formula. So norm SINV and 0 0.01. And there we go. We now have the value, the number of standard deviations to the left of the mean that will get us our, our VAR at 1%. All right, now let's go ahead and calculate VAR of 5%. So what we're gonna do is we're going to take our mean return that we just calculated, and we're going to add to that our 5% lower bound, which indicates that uh, 1.64 standard deviations lower than the mean will get us to the point where 5% of future observations occur below that point and 95% occur above that point. And to that, we're going to multiply our monthly standard deviation. So there we go. Our value at risk at the 5% level is negative 6.47%. What this tells us is that we can say with 95% certainty that the next month will not be worse, or we will not earn a return less than minus 6.47%. So let's go ahead and do the same thing for VAR at the 1% level. So equals mean plus our 1% lower bound times the standard deviation. And what we're finding here is obviously a lower percentage. Basically, it's further down the left tail. So we can say with 99% uh, certainty that we are going to have a return higher than negative 9.48% next month. All right, now let's go ahead and scale all of this up to annualized uh, returns and standard deviations, and then we'll calculate our annualized Sharpe ratio. All right, so we need to use the scaling up formula. So one plus our monthly return. We'll take that to the power of 12 because we're scaling up uh, by 12 months. And I actually have some poor words, word choices here. And we're going to delete that. Next, we're going to scale up our risk-free rate. So we're just taking 1 plus our geometric mean monthly risk-free rate to the power of 12 minus 1. And there we go. It's 4.88%. Next. Let's get our annualized standard deviation of our index. So here we're going to multiply our monthly standard deviation by the square root of 12. 
Next, we're going to get our annual risk premium, or as some people would call it, the, the excess return, uh, since we're using historical data here. So here we're going to take our annualized geometric mean return minus our annualized risk-free rate, and that is our risk premium or excess return, since we're using historical data. Next, let's get our annualized Sharpe ratio. So we're just going to take our risk premium divided by our annualized standard deviation of our index. Like I said, usually the lowest standard deviation you'll see for a stock or a, a portfolio of stocks is going to be about 15%. And there we go. Our annualized Sharpe ratio is 0.3332. So this, we could take this and compare it to the Sharpe ratio of specific assets or other, like an ETF or a mutual fund, and see which security or index has the higher risk-adjusted return. So that's the reason why the Sharpe ratio is so important. It's, it's our, one of our best measures of risk-adjusted return. Before I wrap up this video, I need to mention some of the drawbacks of assuming that returns are normally distributed. The first drawback is that unlike the normal distribution, which has bounds of negative infinity to positive infinity, your minimum return is bounded on the left-hand side at negative 100%. This is because you can only lose what you invested. In other words, in the real world, the left tail of the distribution is a bit shorter than it is in theory. Second, as you'll see later in this course, investors might not be rational. Investors tend to buy hot stocks and bid up the price beyond the intrinsic value and then sell stocks and push the price below the intrinsic value for several reasons. We'll cover behavioral finance later in this course, but suffice it to say that retail investors tend to want to hold stocks that are well marketed or are well known or are, for a better word, sexy, kind of like Tesla in the last couple of years. Finally, the normal distribution doesn't account for fraud. The return on a stock will be very negative if a serious case of fraud is discovered, like the Enron accounting scandal. In the real world, there are more negative returns due to fraud than the normal distribution would suggest. On the other hand, there are also more very large one-day returns in the real world than the normal distribution would predict. Taken together, what I'm trying to say is that the tails of return distributions in the real world are fatter than they are in theory. So why do we assume that returns follow a normal distribution? Well, the answer is simple. In order to do productive research and to exercise good investment management, we need some framework. Normality provides that framework. While it's true that stock returns may not be exactly normally distributed, the benefits to assuming normal distribution are much greater than the drawbacks. However, if you're wondering what probability distribution returns actually follow, the answer is the log normal distribution. In other words, if we take the natural log of one plus each return, the log normal distribution will transform into a normal distribution and that'll get us to the actual distribution of returns. All right, so let's go ahead and recap. So we use historical pricing data to calculate stock returns and volatility. The Sharpe ratio is our measure of risk-adjusted return. It's one of our best measures, although you'll see other measures both in this course and in the next course that you take in investments. Next, value at risk is a valuable tool for estimating the risk of an asset or a portfolio. And then finally, while returns are not exactly normally distributed, assuming they are lets us use advanced statistical techniques. And so with that, I'm going to wrap up. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. If not, I will see you on the next video.